Facebook. Well, welcome, everyone. That was One Life for John DeVries, obviously amazing guitar player. Just to warm up your morning to get us started with what we're doing today. My name is Brett Nicholson. I'm the pastor here, and I want to welcome everybody that's joining us from our other campuses. Um, we're at the East Campus, but we also have one in Henderson and one on the west side of Evansville. And then many of you are joining online. And also, we have a special guest today with Trinity, uh, Trinity Radio viewers through YouTube uh, also joining us as well. So welcome to all of you who are coming to something that's going to be a little bit different. And there's going to be a video that plays right after I'm finished that explains this more in depth. We're doing today what we call One Life Explorer Edition. In other words, we take uh, a service a month and uh, we design it for those who are exploring or open to exploring the Christian faith. And uh, we want to create an environment where you can, uh, you can ask questions, you can wonder about things, and we deal with subject matter uh, that especially gets to hopefully intellectual credibility of the faith, because I know a number of people may think, you know, the Christian faith is, it, it seems like it can be a little fairy taleish, something like that. And we want to answer those questions and give you some things that would enhance your understanding of the intellectual credibility of the faith. And that's especially true today. We say it this way we believe that you can bring your brain to church. And I really hope you brought your brain today uh, because, first of all, we're going to be talking about your brain, but also we're going to be introducing subject matter probably a lot of us have not heard before uh, in this way. Anyway, we're going to be studying the subject of consciousness. Now, first of all, consciousness and its relationship to our brain. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion going on about this. One of the things that's being wondered about right now, uh, Elon Musk, for instance, has warned that maybe uh, we're building uh, artificial intelligence that may have consciousness someday and take over the world, things like that. Uh, can that happen? But it also could be viewed as evidence for God, evidence for the existence of the soul, and evidence for the afterlife. And we're going to be talking about all those things today. So we'll be inspiring uh, some questions in your mind. Now, uh, the way we're going to go about this, sometimes we're going to do this fairly simply. Today, we're going, to, we're going to add some production elements because we're talking about consciousness. So you actually have 3D glasses if you're at one of our live um, uh, services. And so there will be a time in the service where you will be cued on the screen to put on your 3D glasses because we want to experiment around with your consciousness today as just a way of looking at things, all right? And during this time, you can, uh, oh, we're, we're going to be doing production. There's a couple things. One, we have a local band, a local to uh, the Evansville area called Ride the Giant, which uh, is a band that's going to perform a couple of the original songs, also a cover tune, uh, just to kind of help us out today. A great band. And then uh, the presenter is going to be Dr. Braxton Hunter. Uh, uh, he has two doctorates and uh, has been thinking about this kind of thing a lot is, uh, and is also the lead of uh, Trinity Radio and president of Trinity Seminary uh, in Evansville. And so he's going to be presenting to us here in just a moment. Now, you can ask questions, and there's a few different ways. You can text to a number that we'll give you, and so anytime you, uh, you want to ask a question, text it in, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can put it in the comments section, or you can go to our website, onelifechurch.org, and look for the Explorer Edition page, and there's a place where you can put questions there. And what we're going to do is we're going to gather up the questions and answer them on our podcast, and then continue the discussion on Trinity Radio's podcast as well, just to, because this will kick off several conversations in people's minds, I'm sure. And finally, I want to recommend a couple resources so you can continue the conversation. The first one is, and these are, we have them at our live campuses. This is called Am I Just My Brain by Sharon Dirkst. Am I Just My Brain? And then there's another one called The Soul by J.P. Moreland. The subtitle is How We Know It's Real and Why It Matters. And so please just be taking those things in as we kind of learn that the Christian faith has a lot of depth to it and a lot of intellectual credibility that sometimes we're not as aware of as, as we should be. Hope you have a wonderful morning this morning, and it will spark your thinking and your conversations. And uh, have a great day. And we're going to play a video now that explains a little bit more in depth what we're doing. See
Beautiful hell of child Sands and free My God, make me a better man Have you ever gazed upon the stars And wondered what our places are Have you ever heard a song for the first time And thought of days that have long since passed by Have you ever hoped a moment would last Only drink and have it last I have often asked what it means to live, to make, to love, create. Stop and ponder the lost of wonder, I wonder. I'm so excited to be talking with you all today about a subject that is just mind-blowing, and that subject is your consciousness. Now, uh, our pastor said a few things about that a moment ago, but the reason you saw all that you just saw and felt and heard 
is because everything that you have been experiencing this morning in this sanctuary is because of your consciousness. Every thought you had, every song that you heard, every color you saw, what you're thinking about the people sitting around you or behind you, what you're going to do after you get done today, stop thinking about that. All of those things are possible because of this incredible ability to experience the world from a first-person perspective that we call your consciousness. That's what we're going to talk about today and whether it provides evidence, good reason to believe that there is a God, that you are a a soul, as the song just said, and uh, all kinds of other things about the afterlife. And so as we talk about that, I want to set it up by picking up on something that Brett said a few moments ago, and that is really one of the big conversations we're having right now in the world is whether artificial intelligences and robots can ever become conscious. I want us to start there and think about this for just a moment as you begin to maybe toy around with the notion that maybe your consciousness and your brain aren't exactly the same thing, even if they're related. So on the screen right now, what you are going to see is you're going to see a number of consumer products that may be in your home or even in your pocket, depending on what they are. We have one of the early smartphones. Did anybody out there ever have one of these flip phones? Not a smartphone, but a flip phone. Anybody have that? Okay, you do. Um, And uh, we have an early Apple phone, and now Apple smartphones and all the other smartphones have these voice assistants. Apple has Siri, and Siri can communicate with you. And what I want you to notice is these are brains of a sort. They're man-made brains. They're robot brains. Uh, But Siri is not really conscious. It's the best that they've been able to do with a consumer product with helping it to fake consciousness. But Siri is just spitting out pre-programmed responses to you. And actually, half the time, it's really frustrating because we have the Roomba robot too, and the Roomba robot will do good most of the time and then get stuck under the couch and you don't know what happened. And the problem is these things are frustrating to us. Now, they're amazing if you feel about it like we do in our family, We're blown away that these artificial intelligences and robots exist on the one hand, but then on the other hand, they're really frustrating because if you asked it this morning, hey, how do I get to One Life East? Maybe it told you, or maybe it said, I don't know, but here's a website. You can read about it on your own. Thanks. Well, why is that? It's because these things aren't conscious like a human being is conscious. Siri, Alexa, Google Home, they don't have this first-person experience. You're not really interacting with a real person who's conscious. You're just interacting with pre-programmed responses. So we have those brains of a sort, the best we can do at, at coming up with a fake consciousness. Then on the other hand, there are some robots that you probably have some affinities for. In a place like One Life and the people that might show up to church at a church like One Life, I I would wager that some of you have some great feelings of uh, love, admiration, or something toward one of these characters. Maybe not. We have Commander Data there, and uh, Commander Data is on Star Trek, and you know, one of his story arcs is he really wants to be a real boy, basically. He wants to have that conscious experience of the world, or he, he acts like he does, and he wants to have a human experience of the world. Then we have the robot from Lost in Space, and some of you may remember the robot from Lost in Space who's always worried about Will Robinson, right? And then we have C-3PO. Everybody knows C-3PO. And when we look at these characters, you probably feel as though you have more of a human connection with these particular robots. And the problem is, yeah, you do, but they're not real. You're not really connecting with robots. Those other things, those consumer products, those are real robots, and you're not connecting on a human level with them. But these robots that are fictional, we really believe them. When we watch them on screen, we think, Commander Data really is sad that he's not a real human being. We look at the robot from Lost in Space, and he's Will Robinson, and we really, really think he's consciously worried about Will Robinson. And C-3PO, when he says, we're doomed, we really think he's terrified. But the thing about it is, you're not really connecting with a robot when you're connecting with those fictional characters, are you? You're not connecting with C-3PO. You're connecting with this man. Anthony Daniels, the man who's inside of the suit, a real thinking conscious person. So this whole, all this talk about uh, artificial intelligences and robots, we're going to come back to that later on. But what I want you to realize right now is we've done the best we can so far and still not conscious. Most of them will tell you they're still not conscious if you ask them. 
Um, On the other hand, what we know we connect with in a conscious way, in a human way, are fictional robots that are actually humans and other human beings. This seems like something that is really powerful and different than just a brain, because those robots have a brain of a sort. Um, Another way to help you understand exactly the difference between your conscious first-person experience of the world, the way that you're awake to the world, like robots or not, is this uh, thought experiment that comes to us from a man named Frank Jackson. Now, I I want you to hang with me. This is the part where if you've got a thinking cap, put it on and straighten it up a little bit. This will cause you to have to think a a little deeply about this. But imagine that that we have a, a story of a woman who is 35 years old, and her whole life she's been in a black and white room. She's never seen color. Now, I know that this is hard for you to imagine, but just imagine that it's possible that we have a person who's 35 years old and this woman has never seen color. Her favorite color, though she's never seen color, is red. She studied all of the symbolic imagery about the color red. She knows all about the wavelengths and the light and all that stuff that makes red possible, but she's never seen the color red. In fact, we could say she actually begins a program in college to try and get a degree in color spectrum theory, and she gets a PhD in color spectrum theory. Her emphasis is the color red, and she knows more facts about the color red than any other person on the planet, but remember, she's never seen it. Now, here's the question. Her brain has all the facts, but if she escapes the room, and the first thing she sees is red. The question is, does she learn anything? She knows all the facts, that's in her brain. Does she learn anything when she experiences red for the first time? I wanna say that I think she does. What she learns is what it's like to see red. She knew all the facts, but now she's got what it's like, this first person experience of the color red. That's what it means to be conscious, to have that kind of an experience. It's an amazing thing. And because of that experience of red being different from just the facts, it's like your brain serves up all the facts and all the data, and then you and your conscious experience make decisions based on those facts, and you decide what you're going to do, and you can imagine. In fact, some of the greatest things about being human are possible because of our consciousness. The things that matter the most. Think about free will, for example. You have free will to make real choices that are meaningful because you have a conscious experience. Because free will is the conscious activity of looking at things and making a conscious decision of one thing over another thing. We have that. We have love because love is a conscious decision to give of yourself for the good of someone else that you love. And we also have imagination, the conscious activity of thinking about the way things are right now and how they could be later on. A song that hasn't been written yet, but you could write it, a work of art, someone who you are in love with, you can imagine what it would be like to be them so that you can love them better. The most important things about being a human being are things that we have because we are conscious. It's really important. And it doesn't seem like we had to be, because these robots aren't. In fact, I think we can detail this a little more by thinking about what it would be like if we weren't conscious, if we had brains but weren't conscious. Now, we've looked at some things like that. We saw the robots. They have a computer brain, but yet no consciousness, and they don't have what matters most about being human. But we actually, in pop culture, like TV, movies, and stuff like that, have come up with an idea for a thought experiment of what it would be like if you had a human being with a body and a brain, but no consciousness. I wonder if any of you all, and it's a little awkward bringing this up in church, but I wonder how many of you have ever seen the television program Walking Dead. Anybody raise your hand out there? Okay, a few of you out there, and some of you are afraid to mention that in church or admit that, Um, but Walking Dead is all about zombies. And what are zombies? Well, they're not real, Braxton. Yes, I know, calm down, they're not real. But even though they're not real, they give us a way of imagining what it would be like if you had a brain and a body but no consciousness. And basically, you'd be wandering around following your instincts everywhere, basically. You clip out consciousness, and you clip out the most meaningful things about being a human. Free will, love, imagination. And it doesn't seem like this is something that we've reproduced in artificial intelligences. You clip out consciousness, and you clip out 
what matters the most. What I want you to do over the next few moments is I want you to think about all the things that are going on in the room. I want you to do an experiment with me. I want you to count all of the things that you are consciously perceiving over the next few moments. And if you've got a pair of 3D glasses, might be a good time to put them on.
Wow, it's like sensory overload, man, but that is fantastic. Did you count how many things you were consciously aware of during the midst of that? Probably not. You probably lost track. But it's amazing because all of that is possible because of your consciousness. We know consciousness is amazing. And, and then the question becomes, okay, well, what is it exactly? How is it possible? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at four problems that I think there are uh, when we discuss consciousness. And when we look at these four problems, I think in answering them, we can find out where the evidence leads and whether it leads to uh, naturalistic atheism or something else or maybe something to do with God and Christianity. So we're going to use these questions. How does matter wake up? Uh, Are you just your body? Are the brain and consciousness related? And does consciousness exist without the brain? So that's what we're going to talk about here. And number one, how does matter wake up? Well, you might think, well, what what does that mean? I'm I'm matter and I woke up this morning. Well, you did wake up and there are parts of your body. I mean, your body is made of matter. But what we mean is, how is it even possible for a brain uh, to become conscious if your consciousness is just your brain? How is it that dirt wakes up? How is it that the lights are on in somebody's home, you know? How is it that you can put enough Legos together, so to speak, you know, physical stuff, and then suddenly you have a person who's awake? It's a little bit of a problem. And by the way, just in case you think, well, yeah, you're going to say it's a problem for naturalism, just matter is all there is to explain how we're conscious, of course you're going to say that. You're a preacher, you're a theologian. Okay, I understand that concern, and that's a valid concern. So what I want to do is I want to introduce you to Philip Goff, who is a philosopher of mine. Here's what he has to say about that. Despite great progress in our scientific understanding of the brain, we still don't really have even the beginnings of an explanation of how complicated electrochemical signaling is somehow able to give rise to an inner subjective world of colors and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us knows every second of waking life. So this is a man, an expert, who's doing work on this very issue, and he says, we don't even have the beginnings of an explanation of how these complicated electrochemical signals give rise to this conscious experience that we have. And in fact, maybe some of you were thinking a moment ago, hold on, you threw up those images of all the consumer products and Alexa and Google Home and all those things, and you said they're not conscious. And sure, they're not conscious. But maybe if we keep working on it and people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and everybody else puts their fingers on it, maybe we'll get a complex enough brain that it will become conscious even though it's not a human being. Well, I mean, you know, that's something that is certainly a big topic today. But Roger Penrose, who is a famous philosopher and a mathematician um, and has been involved in some of the great scientific breakthroughs, and he says, I don't think conscious, this is one of the great mysteries, I don't think consciousness is in this glass of water, as he said, looking at a glass of water. He said, but it seems to be something we have, and I don't think it's just a matter of making things more complicated, and then somehow you'll be conscious. It seems to be something subtler than that. So that comes from an expert who says, it doesn't seem like complicated artificial intelligence is the answer. So there are two options that we're going to look at Um, here real quickly. One option is maybe the way that dirt wakes up and you're awake to the world in a way that grass and robots are not, maybe that's because everything is conscious. You're conscious, but everything is conscious. Believe it or not, this is a popular view that's getting more popular all the time in the philosophy of mind and in the science about this, and it's called panpsychism. Now, don't worry about that. There won't be a test, and you'll probably never need to know that. But you can Google it if you want to. Panpsychism is the view that everything on some level is conscious. Electrons are conscious. Cheesecake is conscious. Bricks are conscious. You're conscious. Everything. This stage is conscious. Now, they don't think that it's conscious to the degree that you are, whatever that means, but to some degree of consciousness. The problem with that is there's really not any evidence. It's just kind of a way to kind of try to answer the question of how you became conscious. Well, because everything's conscious. Okay, so there's that, if you want to think about that for a moment. And then there's a naturalistic answer, like an atheist might say, an atheistic naturalistic answer that says, well, maybe the solution is nothing is conscious, including you, at least not the way that you think. Alex Rosenberg, author of The Atheist's Guide to Reality, says the following, The illusion that there is something inside that has thoughts about stuff 
is certainly as old as the illusion that there are thoughts about stuff. They almost certainly evolve together as a package deal. But if the physical facts fix all the facts, uh, then there can't be a me or you inside our bodies with a special point of view. When it fixed the facts, physics ruled out the existence of selves, souls, persons, or non-physical minds inhabiting our bodies. He later says about this, our brain navigates us through life very nicely, thank you, without ever thinking about anything. Now think about what's just been said. This is one naturalistic answer. There are others, but this is one naturalistic answer is that, well, yeah, it is hard to explain how matter becomes conscious, but listen, the, the solution may be that everything's conscious, and it may be that nothing's conscious, including you at least, not the way that you think you're conscious. It's more of just an illusion, an afterthought. Your brain's really doing everything. Now, I'll just tell you as a pro tip, if uh, any philosopher, atheist, Christian, or anybody else ever suggests to you that maybe you should adopt the position that you don't exist, then I would encourage you to reject that view, all right? So we've got those possible answers. One doesn't have any evidence, and one seems like it, it doesn't make sense of our experience. But that's problem number one. We've got to come to a, an answer about that problem. But problem number two is, are you just your body? You know, we had a song where he says, you, 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 are, you have a body, you are a soul. You're not a body, you have a soul. Well, God wanted us to be uh, spiritual, soulish beings in, in a physical body if you believe in God. But, but here's the question we've got to ask about this idea of are you your body? You know, if you're just your body and your brain is just what you are, and we do kind of think that way almost default, don't we? I mean, you know, you, if you touch me, I say you touched me. You touched my physical body. Maybe I'm my brain. Maybe that's what's going on. But do you know that your body actually isn't the same body you used to have? This may be shocking to you. But ever so often, your cells cycle out over seven to 10 years and are replaced by new cells. Some of them happen more quickly than others. Uh, blood cells are different than skin cells, but even right now, you're fluffing off dead, just look at yourselves. You're fluffing off all these dead skin cells right here in our midst, and, and you're replacing those with new skin cells, which means after a couple of decades, you, you don't have the same physical body that you used to have, and so we've got a real problem with what does it mean to talk about you? Now, this is a, an example that some of you may have heard before of this sort of idea, but whether or not George Washington ever chopped down a proverbial cherry tree, you familiar with that story? Uh, if, you, if someone took the, put an ax in my hand and said, this is the ax, and there's only two parts, the head and the handle, this is the ax that George Washington used to chop down the cherry tree. Braxton, you're holding the ax. Now, the head of it's been changed 17 times, and the handle of it's been changed 30 times, but you're holding the ax. Well, am I? I mean, I don't really feel like I am because there's only two parts to this and they've all been changed, right? It's not the same ax. In the same way, if you're just your body and your body it gets changed and cells are replaced over time, at some point, you're not you anymore if you were your body. And I don't mean it like, oh, I'm not the same person I used to be. No, no, we're talking about you're literally not the same identity that you used to be. And that is a serious, serious problem. Whatever the solution is, it's got to handle problem number two. Num number three, the next problem is, are the brain and consciousness related? See, the issue here is, it does seem to be the case, doesn't it? That we can change our conscious experience by interacting with our brains. Some of you may be on anxiety medication or depression medication. This is something that changes your brain chemistry. And then because of that, your conscious experience change. I mean, that's the whole point, right? And then of course, there are great stories, like amazing stories anyway, like there's a man who had a railroad spike shot through his head and he survived. And he actually went on living, but he had a different conscious experience. So it does seem like there's some connection between our consciousness and our brain, but yet they're not the exact same thing. And so we've got to come to a solution about that. And then four, we've got to have a solution about whether consciousness exists without the, phys without the brain, without the physical body, without the brain. Now, th this one is a bit mind-blowing, and, and you're about to, uh, some of you might roll your eyes a little bit, but just, just stay with me. It's too early for you to think I'm a kook yet. But I want you to understand that we have these experiences that happen in the, that are written up in the medical journals. Uh, people talk about them all the time. 30 million cases in America, England, and Europe that are near-death experiences. 
Now, there's a lot of eye rolling when you talk about near-death experiences, because even among Christians, it sounds a little wacky, it sounds a little psychic-y, and we you don't like that sort of thing. But for Christians in the audience, uh, Christians should be totally okay with the notion that we survive physical death, right? That's kind of one of, the, one of the things we talk about. But these stories are amazing. And often they're evidential and seem to indicate that consciousness continues even without the brain functioning. When people have no measurable brainwave activity and, and no heart rate, and, and yet they are resuscitated later, and they talk about amazing experiences and facts that can be checked, or they talk about another very interestingly and mysteriously heavenly world that they experience. Now, um, one of these stories comes from Kimberly Clark, who talks about a patient named Maria. And when Maria had no brainwave activity, measurable brainwave activity, and heart rate, she had an experience like this. When she was resuscitated later, she talked about how she had left her body during the interaction, during the surgery or whatever, and she actually could talk about what was on the floor in the room and what the doctors were doing and things getting moved around while they were trying to save her life. She actually said she went outside of the hospital and that on the roof of the hospital, there's a blue tennis shoe with a worn out spot right where the pinky toe should be. They went and checked it out. Guess what? She was right. There was a blue tennis shoe up there. Same style, she said, with a worn out spot exactly where she said it would be. These stories are amazing because they suggest, they are evidence that suggests that your consciousness actually continues when your brain isn't functioning. This is amazing. One of my favorite stories is a story of a uh, uh, Gary Habermas tells, he's a philosopher at Liberty University, and he tells this story about how he was giving a talk like this before a group of nothing but medical professionals. And as he was talking about the heavenly experiences that people have when they encounter these near, near-death experiences, it, he said a, a woman who was the wife of an ear, nose, and throat doctor over on this side of the crowd stood up. She said, you're talking about heaven, and I can tell you all about it. I've, I've experienced that. And after a few moments of them staring at her like an animal cracker, like you all are staring at me right now, um, an an oncologist who was an atheist stood up on the other side of the crowd and said, well, don't just stand there. Tell us about it. And she said, okay, I was giving birth to our third child, and I bled out on the table, and, and I was declared dead. Now, we're not saying she was really dead. Modern medicine could come pretty close to crossing that line and bring someone back. But, but while she had no brainwave activity, no heart rate, she said, I was in an amazing place, a heavenly place. And uh, she said, I can tell you about it. I'll tell you about the color. And then she stopped herself and said, no, because when I say color, you're thinking of red and green and blue. These are colors that the human eye can't perceive. She stopped and said, I can tell you about the music. And then she said, no, because when I say music, you're thinking about Mozart and Beethoven. This is music like you've never heard. She said, I guess I can't tell you about it. He said, let me ask you this. Are you convinced you were there? She said, I'm more convinced I was there than I am that I'm here right now. And he said, my understanding is that the strongest bond two human beings have is the bond between a mother and her child. Do you agree with that? And she said, yes. He said, let me ask you this. You had two sons who you knew and loved and one who was, uh, you'd carried for nine months but had not yet held in your arms. If you had your way, would you have stayed there or would you have come back to be with your family? And she looked at the ground and she began to weep. And she said, he could have raised our family. I would have never left that incredible place. You say, Braxton, do you think that woman went to heaven? Man, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, there are millions of stories of near-death experiences that seem to suggest we survive after our brains aren't functioning. And as you think about that for a moment, I want you to listen to this song, beautiful song about life, death, and hope. No. 
my tower of wine Trumpets blared the fight Sirens red claimed the night And I watched the panics gone Sounding the alarm Weighing on this troubled mind Time to wonder why Pondering I ply Pray to Lord Make it right And I Stare into the great unknown Through the window of my phone Just to glimpse the world outside And I don't know what the future holds. It's Alice and see we sow. Refuge and beauty grow. I know, know that I'm not alone. With you, I'll get old. Watching my children grow. It's powerful, powerful song, powerful song. We have to face the reality of death and, and what it means for our lives and how we live our lives and whether there's hope. As, as we come to the, to the end section here, I, I want us to draw together some of the threads of what we've been discussing, and I want us to think about what it means so let's look at some of the options that we've mentioned earlier for what consciousness is and how it's possible, and let's look at how those options answer these four questions, because they need to answer these four questions. So first, how does matter wake up? Are you just your body? Are the brain and consciousness related? Does consciousness exist without the brain? So let's talk about those for, for just a, a moment. We have one option, which is the option that's panpsychism, which is a weird, I know, thing, but the idea that everything is conscious, every slice of pizza, uh, every earlobe, every chair in this room, everything is conscious, right? Okay, how does that stack up to answering these questions? Well, how does matter wake up? It would explain that pretty well because it says it didn't wake up, it's just that it's always been there. It's, it's baked into the system. Consciousness is a part of everything. Are you just your physical body? Well, this answer could also say about that, well, yeah, maybe you're just your physical body because, um, you know, you, 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 the, the consciousness is built into that stuff. But the problem is, it still wouldn't explain how you continue as the same person over time. Because those bits, even if you want to say they're conscious, get traded out and you have a new body. And on that view, you'd have a new consciousness. Well, what about the fact that the brain and consciousness are related, that if we affect the brain with medication or an injury, then it does affect consciousness? Well, this view would answer that all right, but it wouldn't answer near-death experiences and how it is that the evidence suggests we go on consciously living after our brain no longer functions. So it doesn't answer that well. All right, so let's put that one aside for a minute. What about atheistic naturalism? Naturalism that says matter is all there is it doesn't answer how does matter wake up. It, there's no answer to that because if you just say no one's conscious, nothing is conscious, well, then matter didn't wake up. 
Uh, and even if you don't say that, if you're an atheist, but you want to say we are conscious somehow, there's no explanation for how it is that dirt put into the right order in a brain makes you awake to the world. Um, so there's a big problem there. It would explain why when you damage or affect the brain, it does affect consciousness because you're just your body. But again, it also wouldn't explain how it is that we seem to go on having some kind of a conscious experience when the brain isn't functioning at a measurable level. So what do we have here? What we have is neither one of these options works. But as you might have guessed, there's a third option, at least. There's a lot to be said that we can't cover here, but there's at least a third option. And the third option is this. Maybe consciousness is best explained as coming from consciousness. Maybe a conscious creator made the world with the intention that there would be conscious beings in it who would then be able to interact in this amazing world of sound and color and experience. Maybe this conscious mind would like for conscious minds to be able to commune with him in a conscious way. Maybe God is the best explanation for consciousness. How does that explain these questions? Well, it would explain how it is that, or why we would resolve the problem of why it is that matter can wake up, because matter doesn't wake up. Matter makes up your physical body and the hardware of your brain, but it doesn't, it doesn't explain your conscious experience. On, on this view, your consciousness is your soul, and your soul it lays on top of you, and that is the part of you that goes on, and that is how you're conscious. Well, what about the idea of, are you just your body? How is it that you remain the same person right now at age 40 that you were when you busted your knee when you fell off your bike at age 10? Well, the body might be changing, and your body might become a different body in a certain sense as cells cycle out, but the soul would continue unchanged. Not to say that you don't learn things, not to say you don't have experiences, but, but the nature of your soul stays the same, and so your identity is still intact. Oh, what about the idea that, of these near-death experiences that you can live consciously after your brain isn't measurably functioning? Well, obviously this has a great answer to that, and it also even explains why many people have a very interesting afterlife sort of experience that they talk about later. This answers that perfectly well. Your body dies, but your soul continues. Your consciousness continues. Now, there is one problem that I skipped that you might think causes a problem for our view of consciousness that God's the best explanation, and that is, does consciousness, uh, uh, are, the consci are the brain and consciousness related? How is it, if our soul is our consciousness, that when we affect the brain, we affect consciousness with medications or injuries? Well, we don't think that the brain is unimportant. Believers think that God has designed the human body in an incredible way and that it has function and purpose. The brain, as I said before, is like a computer that serves up the facts, and then in your conscious experience, you make decisions based on those. And, and here's what I want you to get from this. When we think about what that's like in your brain, it's kind of like your brain is the hardware. It's like an AM, FM radio, if you remember AM, FM radios. They still exist. That's like your brain. It's the hardware, and a signal or a song plays through that FM radio. But if you damage the radio... The song isn't going to sound right, is it? It's going to come through distorted or in some other way different. But you didn't affect the song. You didn't damage the music. You just damaged the hardware. Now, in this similar way, if you damage your brain or if you affect your brain with medication, your consciousness may be a little different, but you didn't destroy the beautiful music of your soul that comes through the hardware of your brain. Those are distinct, although they are related. So I submit to you the best explanation for your conscious experience is that there is a conscious creator who created you with this ability to have free will and make real meaningful decisions, moral decisions, important decisions. Uh, you have imagination so that you can think about a beautiful song and write it or a sculpture and make it or what you're going to eat and then fix it. You can love because love is real and important and you can choose to freely give of yourself for the good of another. These things are all possible because of this incredible ability that God gave you to experience the amazing world he made, your consciousness, your soul. And the most important thing, and here's where I will just maybe say some things that sound a little preacher-like, if that's true, then the most important thing you could do with your conscious experience is choose to give it all to Jesus, to serve him, 
Now, I haven't said anything about Jesus. You might say, well, you've given me good reasons to believe maybe that there's a soul and maybe God and maybe an afterlife, but how do I know that it's the Christian one? Well, real quickly, I'll just say this. I don't have time for another presentation, and this church has done a presentation on this before, but if you, if you don't believe in the resurrection, I'll tell you what. I, I understand it sounds wild to people, but I want you to realize this. When we're talking about the facts around the life and death of Jesus, there are a few facts that people, that historians, whether they're Christian, atheist, or whatever in between, at accredited uh, schools and universities all over the Western world universally agree about, historically. That is that number one, there was a Jesus, that he thought of himself as God's agent to bring about the kingdom on earth. That it was gonna turn the world upside down, this message. They believe that uh, he died by Roman crucifixion under the prefect Pontius Pilate, just like the Bible says. They believe that he did, that after his death, his earliest followers had experiences that they at least interpreted as appearances of the risen Jesus. And that they were so committed to this new faith, this claim about the resurrection, that they were willing to be persecuted and die for it, and some of them did die. So here's what I want to say to you. If, G, if, if God exists and God raised Jesus from the dead, if that's true, if that's a historical fact, then it means that it's very, very important. And it means that there's hope. There's hope for you. You know, the, the, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. John 3.16 tells us, for uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The most important thing consciously you can do today is give it all to Jesus or at least decide to think about these things in greater detail because there's hope. You know, for some of you, you've, I don't want you to raise your hand, but you've lost someone, someone's died who you love and they're a, they were a Christian. And some days you'll walk around the house and you'll see a picture of them and it won't be that big of a deal, but then other days you'll see that picture and you just cry all day long. Or some place in the community that you used to, used to be a special place for the two of you. And, and now on Thanksgiving, Maybe someone else is sitting in the chair they always sat in, but as far as you're concerned, that, that's their chair. You know what that's like? There's hope. There's hope. The evidence suggests there's hope that you can see them again. You can see them again. And I hope that you will make this decision today to give it all to Jesus. Because if your consciousness survives from one cell to the next as your body changes. And if you can remain conscious even after the brain stops functioning, then you can remain conscious even after the death of your body. I would ask all of you all to do something with me right now. Just, just think about this for a moment while I'm going to pray. We believe as Christians that our consciousness, part of what's amazing about it is we have this consciousness and God is conscious and we can consciously interact with our God in prayer. We're gonna do that right now and perhaps it's your moment to pray to the God that you might not even believe in and ask him to reveal himself to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all that you give us. When you gave us stars to enjoy, you could have given us one star and we'd say, look, just look at the star. But when you gave us stars, you gave us billions of stars. Father, I just pray that, you, that as you've given us this ability to experience that world, that you would just nudge anyone here closer to this reality. That anyone here who doesn't know you could come to know you for the first time today. We ask all this in the name of Jesus.